purpose as Christians and how we really are missionaries. And so now, uh, I know we've eaten, ran around a little bit, uh, but you might be getting a little tired. I am too. We're going to fight through it. I want to talk about what that actually means. How do we actually live out that mission in our everyday lives? So I think to do that, we can look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You're probably all at least generally familiar with this. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So there's really two themes here, right? Jesus says, and he's speaking to his disciples when he says this, he says, you are salt and you are light. So for this portion, we want to talk about what it means to be salt. You are salt. Now, salt is something that I am very familiar with because I like way too much of it. I put salt on everything. I put it on anything that's hot generally. I put it on watermelon. I put it on macaroni and cheese. I put it on just about everything. When I was little, I was real weird, and I put salt on my donuts because I thought that was cool. All right? Honestly, you should try it. It's not the worst thing in the world. Okay? So what is the purpose of salt? Well, in this time, in Bible times, it would have been mainly to preserve things, right? Today, we use it primarily as a flavor enhancer. It's something that brings out and adds to the flavor of whatever it's put on. Now, the thing with salt is you can't use too much. Because if you use too much, it overpowers everything else, right? Now, we've talked about all this before. Like you, You've heard this lesson before. What I think I want to talk about today is how we actually live that out in our daily lives. Like, what, what does it actually look like? What does it feel like to be salt? Right? So, here's the first thing. In John 15, you know, we talked about how salt enhances the flavor of whatever it's put on. John 15 says, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, this is Jesus speaking, he says, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus says that when you bear fruit, God is glorified. Now, what does it mean to bear fruit? Bear fruit is just the actions that are required to be a Christian, essentially, what we learn is that being a follower of Christ means that you are going to do the things of Christ. And when you do those things, there will be results that come of it, and those results are the fruit, right? And so Jesus says that when you do the work, when you fulfill the mission that you've been called to do, God is glorified. So here's what's cool about that. It means that I'm not doing this mission. I'm not on this mission for me. It's not about me. It's not about the attention I get. It's not about people knowing my name. But it's about God. So the purpose of my life, the purpose of your life, is to put more attention and point more glory and honor and praise to God. That's what we're here for. And that's how salt works, right? When you eat a steak that has salt on it, if it's salted well, you don't go, oh, wow, that's some great salt, right? You go, oh, that's a great steak. 
Because it's, you're not having the meal for the salt. The salt's just there to help. But the meal's about the steak. And that's how we work. This isn't about us. It's about God. And so what we do, what you do, has to point to God in everything. Now, I think one of the things that we probably struggle with is that when we think about this, we typically think about it within the confines of this building. And what we've done is we've taken our spiritual lives, what we have a tendency to do, I should say, is we take our spiritual lives and we put them within the confines of what we know as a church building, and it doesn't really leave. But the thing is, is that you can be salt and should be salt in every single aspect of your life. You know, I'm thinking about how salt works. Um, so my wife and I, a year ago, uh, this, it was August 2nd, so a year ago, a couple days back, uh, Leo, uh, our foster son, came into our lives. And so here's, here's something you need to know about having kids, right? This is really important. I just want to let you know this. Um, when you have a kid, no one cares about you anymore, honestly. My parents, they come to see us. They live four hours away. They come to see us uh, about twice a month, but they're not actually coming to see my wife and I. They're coming to see our, our foster son, Leo. Uh, whenever we go anywhere, when I walked in the building today, people go, oh, hey, Andrew, where's Leo? Right? It's all about him now. People want to see him. It's not really about me anymore. You know, sometimes I want to go, oh, well, you know, I'm still cool. Like, it's okay that I just came by myself. People don't want that. They want to see him. And to be honest, now for Tiffany and I, our lives are centered around him. The decisions we make are all kind of about him and his future and, and where he's going to go. It's, it's not what happens with me and her and what we want to do. And it's, that's not really nearly as important anymore. And that's kind of how salt works. Every decision we make is about God. Every decision we make, everything we do is about God. So if I decide that I'm going to be an athlete and I'm going to play sports, God's at the center of that somewhere. If I decide that I'm going to pursue academics to a high level, God's got to be at the center of that somewhere. That goes back to what we were talking about with living on mission, right? If we live on mission, if we understand the mission that God has given us, that means that everything we do is a part of that mission. We're doing it for Him. So what does it look like for you to be salt in whatever area of your life you're excelling at right now? Uh, if you're someone who is, I, I have two students back home who are just like world-class cheerleaders. Uh, there's two guys, and they are at a school that has a great co-ed cheer team. Uh, the oldest brother, Zaire, he just got a full ride to cheer at UCF, right? And for him... We spend a lot of time talking about what it looks like to be a cheerleader in an environment with a lot of other students who really don't care anything about God, what it looks like for him to be a cheerleader that is focused on God. So Zaire's senior year, uh, they competed in the national championship. They had won the national championship the year before, and they had won it, I believe, two years before that. Well, last year they lost by like two points. Now, I'd never been to a cheerleading competition before. It's not really something that I grew up caring about. And so I went to that one last year. And first of all, it was actually kind of awesome. I really enjoyed it, even though I didn't want to admit it. But when they lost that national championship, it hurt. It hurt at all of those kids. They'd worked all year for that. And a lot of them felt like they let people down because that school was known for winning that national championship and they lost and every single one of those students hung their heads cried you could just tell how disappointed they were and you could tell that they had lost something really important to them except for Zaire the way that Zaire acted in that he was disappointed he was a little frustrated 
But the way that he acted, the way he carried himself, you could tell that while that competition meant something to him, there was something bigger going on in his life. Something that meant more. Look at this passage. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, and we're actually going to read a little bit of this and then come back to it. It says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Let me go back one. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So basically, what this passage says is that Christians smell like Jesus. Now, this is a weird thing to think about. Um, number one, they didn't have deodorant back then, so all of the people in Bible times probably didn't smell that great anyways, but that's not really what it means. What it means is that when we live our lives, if we are focused on the mission and if we are focused on being the salt of the earth, then what that means is that when people are around us, just like somebody who has a funky smell, they may look normal, they may act normal, but you can just tell that there's something different, right? When someone smells a little, a little off, you can smell it coming, and the closer you get, the stronger it gets, right? Um, I work with a lot of middle schoolers. Middle schoolers, close your ears for a second, I'm going to talk about you. Listen, I was on a bus recently with 22 middle school boys, okay? Of those 22, we maybe had one that knew how to use deodorant, okay? What we did was we went to a trampoline park. The bus on the way there was great. It was enjoyable. Riding that bus back after 21 boys with no deodorant on, jumping around on the trampoline park, was one of the most miserable experiences I've ever had in my life. We have a bathroom on our bus, and that bathroom always smells bad. I went and sat in the bathroom half the ride just to get away from the smell was how bad it was. See, the closer you get to someone who smells a little weird, the worse it gets, right? But see, that's how it kind of works as a Christian. You see, if we carry the aroma of Christ, people can tell who it is that we serve. They can tell. So that's my question for you. Do you think that the people in your life can tell which master you serve? What do you smell like? Do you smell like Christ or do you smell like something else? A couple months ago, the young adults at my congregation at Highlands, we went on a beach trip. And so we all went to the beach. My wife was there and her coworker. Uh, who also attends our church. Em her name is Emily. She was there as well. And when we got there, we noticed that there was this like youth camp going on. And it was a youth camp uh, for kids with autism. And they were surfing. And there was a bunch of volunteers who had taken all of these kids uh, who deal with autism surfing. And it was a really cool, like really neat thing. So my wife and her friend Emily uh, at the time, they worked for a place called Trek Behavioral Services, and they did behavioral therapy with kids with autism. And so they just thought that was the neatest thing, and that was really, really cool. We really enjoyed, like, sitting on the beach and kind of watching all of that go on. Um, but then all of a sudden, there was this huge windstorm that came through. And I mean, like, windstorm. And it lasted for about 30 minutes. It was taking people's umbrellas and tents. Surfboards were flying everywhere. It was pushing the sand so hard that you really couldn't see anything. Like you had to cover your eyes. It was bad. Well, as you can imagine, you know, there were 40-something kids, young kids with autism there. And it got kind of crazy pretty quick. And so there was one mom who had two of her children both... Uh, with autism, and one of the children had run away, 
and the other one was trying to run away, and this mom's umbrella and all of her stuff was blowing 50 different directions. And so we see this woman, and we see all of her stuff flying everywhere. She's holding on to the one kid, trying to keep him from running. She can't find her other daughter. She has no idea what's going on. She's completely by herself. And so Emily and my wife just immediately, like, jump into work mode. And Emily goes and takes the girl and gets her calmed down. Tiffany goes with the mom and, and tries to find or tries to find her other child. Uh, a couple of the guys went and we started grabbing her stuff. We're just helping her because that's what you do, right? And so after about 15 minutes, they were able to find the other kid, got the daughter calmed down. Everything was good. The wind had finally dived down. And the lady goes, so what's up with y'all? <laughs> And we were like, what do you mean? And she said, well, what's like, what's your deal? You know, and Tiffany said, well, you know, my friend and I, we're, we, we do behavioral therapy. You know, we, that's, that's kind of our job. And she said, no, like, I get that. But like, what, what's your thing? Like, what do you have going on here? You see, she could tell that something was different. She could tell that there was something different about these people who had decided to help her. And I would love to say that that's how our lives work all the time, but at least for me, it's not. Even as someone whose job it is to work for the church, I don't know that people can always tell just by being around me, by the way that I live my life, which master I serve. But that's what we've been called to do. Now let's look at the rest of this because maybe we can figure out how it is we can actually make this happen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, um, we're going to kind of read the second part of that, this passage that we left off earlier. It says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Now think about that. Let's pause there for a second. Paul here talks about being the fragrance and the aroma of Christ, but then he says, who's good enough to do this? But then he says this, he says, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. That word peddler is not a word that we probably or that you probably use very often. When I think of that word, um, I, my grandfather used to watch a lot of Western, like old Western TV shows, you know, the black and white stuff. I always thought they were super boring, but I would watch them with them. And in almost every Western, there's this guy that walks around with a cart, you know, with a mule on the front. And this cart has like all kinds of things just all over. It's got pots and pans and, and guns and tents and wagon wheels and every type of good you can imagine, right? That's a peddler. And so this peddler walks around with all of his goods trying to sell everything. Now, the thing about peddlers is... They're just trying to make some money. They're just trying to make a buck. So they don't really care if what they're selling you is any good. They don't care if it works. All they care is that you pay for it. And the nice thing about being a peddler is a peddler moves from town to town. So a peddler can sell you something that's not worth anything, or he can sell you something that's broken, and by the time you figure it out, he's going to be gone and in the next town. And so this is what Paul is saying. He says, we are not peddlers of God's word. We're not here trying to sell God to people. That's not our job. I think sometimes we take a sales approach to the gospel. And when it comes to evangelism, we try to sell people Jesus. But that's not what this is about. Because we don't just hand out God's word, we live it and we tell it and we show it to people through our lives. We say it with our mouths too and we teach it, 
but probably the best lesson you could ever teach somebody, the best way you could ever show someone Jesus is to live it with your life, is to be salt. We're not some peddlers who don't really believe in this thing that we're just handing out to people, but we are people who believe it and know it and love it and live it in everything that we do. And so, if we go back to this idea of salt being something that enhances whatever it's put on, how do we be salt on this earth? We make this earth better. That's what we do. We live like Jesus. We smell like Jesus. We look like Jesus. And when we do that, people will know People will be able to tell who it is that we serve. And all that does is point more and more people and more glory and more honor to Christ. Are you salt? In a little bit, after uh, I think another lesson, we're going to talk about what it means to be light.